All right, we are going to talk about polio virus. I've already mentioned polio virus before in a couple other videos, um, particularly in the videos where we talked about Coxsackie and echovirus, because polio virus is an enterovirus, just like Coxsackie and echo, as well as hepatitis A virus. So it does have some things in common. Um, most of you have probably heard about polio before. Most are well aware of the theory that our 32nd president, President um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, may have survived polio. However, that is somewhat in doubt. He was diagnosed with a paralytic illness in 1921 at the age of 39, but his symptoms are a lot more consistent with GBS, Guillain-Barre, um, than they are with polio. Um, so we can probably take um, President Roosevelt off of our survivors of polio list. But fear not, there are many other people who have been infected with polio of which we should care about. Um, Alan Alda, aka Hawkeye Pierce from the classic show MASH, contracted polio at seven years of age. Um, he was actually given a rather painful treatment in which hot woolen blankets were applied to his limbs and his muscles were stretched out by massage. Um, Donald Sutherland, aka President Snow for all you Hunger Games fans, and an incredible pyromaniac in the 19 91 classic backdraft also suffered from polio and survived. Francis Ford Coppola, um, he was, uh, he is, sorry, a writer, director, producer, and a polio survivor. He actually was confined for over a year to a single room at the age of nine. Um, nine is a popular age for polio. Uh, Joni Mitchell started singing at age nine while in the hospital recovering from polio. And in fact, her distinctive sound features dozens of non-standard guitar tunings, which she developed partly to compensate for a weakened arm. So polio helped give us Joni Mitchell. Who knew? Okay, so what is polio besides a um, inspirer of um, music and arts, apparently? Um, so polio is a virus. It's a coronavirus, like I mentioned. It has a lot in common with Coxsackie and Echo because they are both enteroviruses. So first thing, um, these enteroviruses don't lead to gastroenteritis. So um, why? I don't know. They infect all sorts of areas of the body, as you can see here, but they don't tend to cause gastroenteritis. They're called enteroviruses, though, because remember, they've got that real thick shell that does really, really well in the gastrointestinal tract. So they're able to survive the um, rough pH twists and turns of our our um gastrointestinal system, which allows them to be transmitted fecal oral. Remember, so just like Coxsackie and um, Echo, they are transmitted through the fecal oral route, and then they are able to move systemically through the body, which is part of why we're talking about them in the brain and behavior block. They do have a cytolytic capacity, which is part of what leads to disease here. Um, so basically they can infect the skeletal muscle, uh, or at least polio can infect the skeletal muscle and then make its way to the brain. Not that different from how rabies initially replicates at like a peripheral site and then makes its way through the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system. There are roughly three different types of polioviruses. Most disease is caused by type one. Um, Two types of vaccines exist. There is a live oral vaccine and a trivalent or inactivated vaccine. Um, so where in the brain does it go? So it travels along the skeletal muscle and then it's cytolytic for motor neurons of the anterior horn and of the brain stem. Um, so it's moving through and then kind of setting up shop in these locations. Um, the location and the number of nerve cells destroyed by the virus pretty much govern the extent of paralysis we expect to see in a patient. And also whether or not those neurons can actually re, um, basically reproduce themselves, can um, come back. And that's going to determine whether or not the patient recovers and gets full range of motion back. Um, the combined loss of neurons to polio and to old age is actually what leads to what we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is a post-polio syndrome. So this is another one of those post-infectious encephalitis or um, post-infectious um, neurologic diseases that is particularly associated with polio. Okay, so polio causes a wide range of clinical syndromes, which um, hopefully you guys are used to hearing me say by now. Um, 
In unvaccinated patients, many of them will be asymptomatic, but it can also lead to paralytic disease, encephalitis, meningitis, respiratory tract infections, and undifferentiated fever. So the majority of patients were still thinking asymptomatic, but when it goes wrong, it can go really wrong. Polio has this kind of weird nomenclature. When we talk about poliomyelitis, we talk about the minor illness and the major illness, and then there's meningitis in between. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how major this major illness is if meningitis is, conceen, is seen as the non-major illness. So let's start with abortive poliomyelitis, also known as the minor illness. This is a non-specific kind of undifferentiated fever. It's a non-specific febrile illness. It occurs in about 5% of infected people. Um, and it's your standard prodrome, fever, headache, malaise, sore throat, vomiting. Um, and it occurs in people about three to four days after exposure. There is this non-paralytic poliomyelitis, this asymptomatic form. This occurs in about one to 2% of patients with poliovirus. Um, in this disease, we basically just see it spreading into the central nervous system, in the meninges, causing back pain, muscle spasms, and all of the symptoms that are associated with the minor illness. Okay, paralytic polio. This is the major illness, and thankfully it only occurs in a small amount of people, 0.1 to 0.2 percent of infected patients with poliovirus infection. Um, and it does tend to have the most severe outcome. It appears about three to four days after the minor illness has subsided. So you get this kind of biphasic disease where a patient has the minor illness, starts to improve, and then develops the major illness. You get spread of the virus from the blood to the interior horn cells of the spinal cord and to the motor cortex of the brain, um, which makes sense. The severity, once again, is determined by how many of those neurons are going to get infected. You can see spinal paralysis, which might involve one or more limbs, um, or you can have cranial paralysis, which might involve the cranial nerves and, either, and even the medullary um, respiratory center. Um, there are basically two broad types, paralytic and bulbar. Um, paralytic, uh, asymmetric flaccid paralysis with no sensory loss. That's kind of how it's characterized. Um, paralysis may progress over the first few days and may result in complete recovery, residual paralysis, or death. And this recovery, you can recover in a couple of weeks, or it can take up to two years for a patient to recover. Bulbar is often more severe um, because it can involve the muscles of the pharynx, the vocal cord, and respiration. Um, and obviously, if the muscles involved in breathing aren't working so well, death is more likely. And it does occur in about 75% of patients with bulbar poliomyelitis. Um, this is actually what iron lungs were used for. These were chambers that basically provided external respiratory compression to patients during the 50s to assist in breathing, um, and they were all over children's hospitals back then. Okay, post-polio syndrome. So once again, this is a post-infectious um, neurologic sequelae. So basically, this one occurs a lot later, 30 to 40 years after the patient has recovered from um, polio, about 20 to 80% of the initial original victims will show this post-polio syndrome. And basically what happens is we see a deterioration of the originally affected muscles. So let's say you had polio as a child and it led to a weakened arm, like our dear Joni Mitchell. Um, 30 to 40 years later, she might also see, I don't think she did, but she might also see some um, deterioration of those muscles. The polio virus is not present because it's post-infectious, but it is believed to be a result of um, loss of neurons during the initial infection. 